Welcome everyone and thanks so much for joining us today. My name is Mary Ann Hensley and I'm the Senior Vice President of Marketing here at FreightWave. We are excited to have you all joining us on the line today uh, for our webinar, which is going to be a slightly different format if you're used to joining us for previous web webinars. Um, we'll be having a conversation that will be moderated by JP Hampstead, who's the Associate Editor here at FreightWave. And he's going to be chatting with Jason Schenker, who is a renowned financial futurist, chairman of the Futurist Institute, president of Prestige of Economics, and a best-selling author. He's also going to be joining us at Market Waves here in the next couple of weeks. So if you haven't gotten your tickets yet to join us there, we uh, encourage you to do so. Um, but specifically, they're going to be talking about the quickly approaching midterm elections and really just taking an agnostic view on what we can expect in terms of the impact on the economy and the freight, freight markets in general. And finally, if you have any issues, uh, this will be a pretty brief webinar. We're looking at 30 minutes here. If you do have any issues, feel free to reach out via chat um, through your Zoom control panel. We will not be having a live Q&A, but if you do have questions, we're happy to address those after the fact. So without further ado, I will go ahead and turn it over to JP. Hey, um, thanks for joining us. And Jason, thanks for uh, making time for us this afternoon. It's so awesome to be able to talk to you like this. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here. So um, why don't you just tell us about the sort of genesis of your book, Midterm Economics? I think it's such a fascinating idea to think about the interaction between macroeconomic fundamentals and politics and the sort of the back and forth between them um, leading up to an election introduces so many kind of unique uncertainties i'd love just to hear about your thought process about designing the project and then what you were able to uncover sure so you know the reason i wrote midterm economics is because i found that a lot of people talk about elections and what they expect will happen but I did some research and found there weren't, there actually really wasn't any analysis of sort of past economic and financial market activities to see if you could actually tease out implications from what a midterm might mean uh, for the economy, for financial markets, what the implications for the presidential election in 2020 would be, what would be the main factors that might change or might not change, no matter who wins uh, with the House and the Senate. And so this was a really interesting project because I, I didn't go into it with any sort of assumptions. This is a, uh, a nonpartisan approach. I was just taking a look at the numbers to see if they told me anything interesting. And they did both in terms of, you know, what, what we historically see, uh, what's going on right now and what we might see uh, for implications going forward. And yeah, so why don't we talk a little bit about the kind the, the sort of the data set that you use to work with. What kinds of um, economic metrics were you keeping track of? Um, which ones proved to be really important? Which ones weren't so important? Um, how far back in time do those go? And what, you know, give us a sense of um, the sort of the number of elections and, and how far back the, the, those political results go? So I looked at a few different things. So the first thing was to look at really since 1930, the different voter turnout numbers in order to kind of, you know, gauge what we've seen in the past because people tend to talk about voter turnout kind of thing. So, you know, the way I structured it was to take a look at how midterms are different than general elections. Right, so that was one part of it. Another part was to look at, you know, what are the current political and economic conditions that are pervasive right now? What are the most important things kind of going on? And as someone who's already forecasting things in the economy, what are kind of the, the most important near-term risk factors, right? And sort of go, okay, you know, what kind of happens in elections? What might we expect with voting? You know, if we look back, uh, you know, looking back almost 90 years, you know, what do we expect for midterms? And then we go, okay, what's going on right now? And then the, the next piece was sort of a looking forward. As we look historically, 
And, and of course, right, this isn't just a backward looking sort of thing. We just want to look at, you know, what are the implications, you know, going forward, especially over the next two years, right? Because that's a, a time frame where people are trying to plan what they might expect, where we should, you know, what should we think about in terms of financial markets, in terms of the economy. And uh, in that case, we looked, you know, some data sets went back further, right? If we looked at, say, equity markets, but, um, you know, we tried to tend to keep that sort of, um, for the, the data set for the economy, generally speaking, we went back to Truman, but for some things we went back to Hoover where it was available. Um, for the financial market data, uh, you know, it was sort of a similar thing, although for some data series, you know, we looked at stock prices, we looked at oil prices, we looked at the dollar, we looked at silver, we looked at uh, a, a number of different markets there as well. And for some of those, you know, we could look back further, but a lot of those didn't really um, float freely, shall we say, or just to sort of more recent market conditions until the 1970s. And so from a time frame standpoint, some of those markets uh, were going to be sort of uh, less consistent than we thought, maybe driven more by other macro factors. But when we looked at both the economic and the the, the financial data changes, you know, we tended to see a, a few different things. Great, thanks. That's that's really helpful. Um, why don't we get right into it? What are the most important economic factors uh, uh, that influence election outcomes? What is the current state of those those economic numbers um, going into the midterms now? And what, what does that mean for, you know, say, you know, the Republican House majority, the Republican control of the Senate, you know, um, how financial markets will behave after the election? Right. So there's a few things that I think that we need to consider right now. And one is that the economy is very healthy right now, right? So, you know, if we think in terms of the unemployment rate, the unemployment rate now is at the lowest level since December of 1969. We're at a 3.7% unemployment rate is exceptionally low. So that's really important, right? That, that's a major market driver. If we look back, uh, I, I was asked recently, when the book came out, uh, I, I had a meeting with a Bloomberg reporter about it. And um, not much to my surprise, I was you know, told that no one had looked at these numbers before. And of course, I, I wasn't surprised by that because I had looked around to see if anything like this existed and it didn't. And I wanted to know what was gonna happen. And so, you know, when you look back, you know, what's interesting is people want to compare this election to other elections. And what some folks have been comparing these midterms to is the 2010 midterm election. And when I was, I was asked this question, you know, is this like the 2010 midterms? And in my mind, uh, you know, and I, I actually said something like, on what planet? Because in November of 2010, the unemployment rate was 10%. And comparing an economy, the U.S. economy, with a 10% unemployment rate, which was what happened in the 2010 midterms, to now where the unemployment rate is 3.7%, isn't even the same ballpark, right? That's that's no way comparable. And so, right. you know, it's so, really interesting if, if we think about where we are right now, this is a really good spot, you know, economically. So... You know, if I remember the 2010 election, this is when the sort of the fragile majority that Obama had put together in 2008 was sort of decisively crushed by a Republican tidal wave. Um, obviously, the economy was really you know, sort of um, doing poorly. A lot of people were feeling economic pain. And that's those are the kinds of situations where you see um, incumbents being voted out. So, change in the Senate was, you know, what it, what it, and 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 in the House, you know, kind of there's very typically, by the way, um, losses in the president's party during midterms. That's a very normal historical thing. Uh, but it, but ignoring kind of the political, I felt like that wasn't a really great analogy because 
you know, people vote on their economic interests in a significant way. And given the health of the economy, you know, that was really a, a major issue in 2010. And right now, the health of the economy, I mean, there are big issues that folks are debating, but that's not really one of them. That's right. kind of, you know, prime on the table. And so it's interesting because as an economist, you're like, all right, we've got to help the economy. You know, what are we looking at also as a backdrop? And so other things to consider are, you know, even though we've had equity market volatility in the last few weeks, and you've seen losses that kind of put the year at flat, you know, we're still a lot higher than we were in 2016. Uh, and, and uh, you know, some markets are still up marginally or a little bit uh uh, it's a big bit of a mixed bag since the beginning of the year. But if we look at equity markets, they're a lot higher than they were at the time of the, the 2016 general election. So uh, this is a really interesting fundamental factor because you basically got a good economy and good markets. Uh, but there's also a hint of a tech bubble, right? There's some frothiness. You see the news kind of now acknowledging these risks. And in that respect, this election feels like, to me, and when I look at the data economically, it seems like 2000, right? 2000 was a very contentious election, and, and it was also especially contentious in its outcome. But the economy was great, and yet you still had uh, dissatisfaction with the system. And there were, uh, with, with a certain number of folks in the voting pool, and so there was some pushback despite a great economy and strong financial markets. So in that respect, the economy wasn't the issue. Now, I realize 2000 was a presidential election, but there was also a tech bubble at the time, and the labor market was wildly hot. And if you ask me, what does this election look like, the political issues are really outside the realm of the economy. The labor market's hot, and there's a tech bubble. And so this feels a little bit like 2000, which already has some implications for, you know, what comes next. I think most people feel like we're late cycle. But as we look at the risks for the economy in the year ahead, most people see those as trade and they see it tied to monetary policy and, and they see it tied to the U.S. debt. Those are, and, and as I see it, those are the three big risks for the economy in the next 12 to 24 months. So monetary policy, trade, and what was the third one? The U.S. debt. U.S. debt. And so those, those are the big risks um, for the next 12 to 24 months, you said. Um, will those be affected by who wins the election? So this is another interesting part of my analysis was looking at could these change? And, um, you know, the, the most important one really, I think, right now is, is trade. And, you know, the, the president has almost unilateral ability to make tariff and trade policy without consulting the legislative branch of the U.S. government. And so this brings us to another interesting question that everyone loves to talk about, but no one ever does the math about, and that's impeachment. So, so let's talk about trade for a second, and then we'll go to this super hot button issue that everyone finds exciting to talk about. So first, for tariffs and trade. Now the USMCA, which is the US-Mexico-Canada uh, agreement, which uh, is very likely to move forward during the month of November, uh, before the, the new Mexican president takes office, but it's like right. what happens after the midterms, uh, right? So um, that is a new piece of legislation and it is a treaty and treaties need to be ratified, which means they have to go through Congress. Now, as for tariffs, tariffs are treaties, tariffs don't have to go through Congress and the number of people the president needs to consult about tariffs like the Section 232s, which affects aluminum and steel, or the 301s, which target China and intellectual property concerns, those tariffs do not need to be confirmed or agreed upon or passed by any legislators. The number of the people that the president needs to talk about this is zero. Now, while the USMCA is likely to move forward, and I believe that's fundamentally going to be a good thing for the U.S. economy, there are a lot of states that are, are, have a lot of jobs tied to what heretofore is NAFTA uh, and, and moving forward will like be the USMCA. 
For the other tariff stuff, if you're wondering how the China situation will play out, it's likely to be very different. Uh, and the reason, there's a few different reasons for this, but if you, know, you think that a new Congress will tra- change the trade dynamics and the tariff risk, you're wrong, uh, because the president has tremendous power here. Now, the only way you could get a change is if you were to impeach the president, and there's a lot of folks calling for an impeachment, and there are different people out there running for office talking about it. Now, an impeachment can move forward with a simple majority in the House. Um, an impeachment, in that case, it has two parts in the U.S. It passes by a majority in the House. That's essentially an indictment. The only way the president can be charged with any kind of criminal activities or with anything at all um, is through an impeachment process. Presidents don't end up in court. There's no sort of, you're not going to see an episode of Law and Order where you hit the dunk dunk and they're going to bring in a president. He's going to be on trial. It doesn't work like that. Uh, the only way a president can ever be either charged with a crime or, or any kind of impropriety or anything at all is if the, the House goes and impeaches the president. So that's kind of step one. And the House does look likely to go uh, Democratic. Now, what that means is an impeachment could very likely move forward, but a successful impeachment where the president would be convicted of anything at all is wildly unlikely. And absolutely, really, it's a mathematical impossibility. The reason is, is that you need a two-thirds majority in the Senate in order to get a successful impeachment. In other words, remove a president from office. Since the president's the only person who controls trade, and there is currently a majority of Republicans in the Senate that control the Senate at 51 seats, uh, there are nine seats up for Senate election that are held by Republicans, 20 seats up uh, that are held by Democrats. So that means even if every single election this fall uh, results in a Democratic win, right, every member of the House of Representatives, right? Every single one, every senator up for election, every governor and every, everyone in every state legislature, every dog catcher, even if everyone in the country up for election is voted in that is a Democrat, you would still need nine Republican senators to cross the aisle to get a successful impeachment. And uh, right now, and, and this is our expectation, that the, uh, although the Senate usually loses seats to the president's party in a midterm, uh, it's our expectation that, that the Senate's likely to hold a Republican majority, which means you wouldn't just need nine senators to cross the aisle. You might need 18 that you need right now. So this is a mathematical impossibility because even though people are talking about this and campaigning on this issue, It's just not going to happen. No one crossed the aisle under the Clinton impeachment process, and no one's going to cross it under a Trump process. What that means for trade is, even though impeachment's super interesting to talk about, there's nothing there. And from a trade standpoint, the current trade risks and trade policy will continue to be in place. The president will continue to issue tariff and trade policy very much along the lines we've seen. Uh, And if you want deeper insight into the China issue, uh, I would probably refer you to Peter Navarro's book. So Peter Navarro is the U.S. trade czar, and he wrote a book. He's written several books, uh, uh, Crouching Tiger, What China's Militarism Means for the World. Another one is called uh, The Coming China Wars, Where They'll Be and How to Win Them. And the one that really is a blueprint for U.S. trade policy towards China is called Death by China. And so this should give you some indication, right, that the trade situation with China might be a bit more, uh, you know, difficult to come to an easy resolution on than with the U.S.-Mexico-Canada agreement where we were, you know, trying to get in a a, a duration piece and uh, improve some access to markets and in the U.S. uh, increase North American content for automotive, right? But, you know, there... Right. But, but, you know, if the trade starters a book out there, death by China, you know, this is about more than giving the, the United States better access to the Canadian dairy market. Right. Right. Like, there's is, probably right, there's this, something is a, uh, this is a highly developed worldview that's deeply entrenched in the Trump administration and it's not going anywhere. 
Right. And since the president's not going anywhere, uh, the, expect the China-U.S. trade situation to remain frayed and potentially get worse. Uh, now, there were two other things I mentioned. So monetary policy was the other. The Fed is independent. Uh, Jay Powell, uh, you know, he's going to be there for six years. Um, and uh, it doesn't matter how the election goes. He will be the Fed chair. The other folks on the Fed, they're there for various durations. They're not going anywhere. Uh, that's not going to change. So the, the Fed's concern about inflation is part of its dual mandate, something that's always existed for the Fed. That won't change no matter who wins. And the third thing is the national debt. Now, the U.S., despite the strong economy, has run the biggest deficit this year in six years. And the tax cuts, which were a once-in-a-generation tax cut, and it tremendously important and valuable for equity markets and for individuals, were not balanced tax cuts. And so as an economist, I'm kind of torn, right? Because on the one hand, right, and, I, and I look at this purely from an economic standpoint, tax cuts are always good. But more debt is always bad. And so the tax cuts weren't balanced, and that was a problem. And then, of course, you know, we saw that the spending bill passed in March resulted in a lot more additional debt. And you also had the spending bill at the end of October with tremendous bipartisan support because it also had a lot more debt component in it. So the national debt's going to go up no matter who wins. Um, if the Democrats do take the House, the debt might go up a little bit more because the way to get bipartisan support is by spending more money you don't have. Uh, but even if Republicans were to win both the House and the Senate, the debt's going to continue to go up no matter what. And so while you've got the Fed raising short-term interest rates, long-term interest rates are also going to go higher. And so the trade risk and the monetary policy and the debt, uh, these risks, unfortunately, the biggest ones right now on the table don't go away no matter what happens in the midterms. Right. Um, that's, that's, really, that's really helpful. So why don't we... Um, narrow this down a little bit to the election itself and if if those three large risks uh those large sort of you know mid to long term risks aren't going to be affected by the election let's talk about what um your best guess is for election outcomes and what what parts of the market and the economy will react to the election so from an election outcome standpoint, uh, you know, and market reaction, I think the thing I would probably point to is that, that we looked at financial markets um, after midterm elections. And what we found generally uh, is over the two year period after midterm elections, between the midterm and the general, that's what we kind of looked at. We said, all right, well, what happens, uh, you know, after midterm elections, and does it matter by party? Does it matter? You know, what, what really matters? And the truth is, we look at party stuff, it's kind of, uh, it's actually less important because one, there's not a huge data series, uh, but it's not really important because the, the results are fairly consistent. Equity markets almost always go up in, in the two year period between the November of the midterm and the October of the general election. Almost always they end higher. That doesn't mean they can't fall in between them because they can, but uh, and, and often have, but they they end usually higher those two years later. And the reason is because almost over almost any two year period, the equity markets usually end higher, right? So uh, that that's that shouldn't be a surprise for the dollar. It usually ends lower that two year period because since we left Bretton Woods you know, the dollar has weakened so significantly. For oil prices, they usually end higher. Well, of course they do, right? Since we got off Bretton Woods and oil prices have floated and we've had trading contracts, generally speaking, those end higher. For silver and gold, it's a bit of a mixed bag since the end of Bretton Woods. Sometimes they go up, sometimes they go down. Um, and Bretton Woods, we got off that system in the early 1970s. But generally speaking, uh, they go up in dollar value changes, the rises are much greater than the declines, both for silver and gold um, uh, over that time period. So, you know, this is, you know, really important. Now, for the economy, uh, th there's actually a more interesting set of very, you know, kind of mixed dynamics. 
where sometimes things go up and sometimes they go down. But rather than kind of just looking at what's going to happen with the economic data, we said, well, let's try to see if the economic data can tell us anything about, you know, what might, you know, what, what's going to happen in 2020. Because even now, you've already got folks kind of hitting the campaign trail uh, for the 2020 presidential election. And, right. and you can see there are some candidates, right? And I'm, I, you know, I, I'm in Texas and, you know, I would say that Beto probably, you know, has his eyes on the national stage and you can see some of that already playing out. And there are a number of other folks already going out to Iowa, even now kind of, you know, laying the groundwork for, for presidential runs. And, you know, that's already imagine- going on. Let's imagine, you know, what happens if the tech bubble pops, if um, the Fed, you know, sort of tightens the money supply even more significantly, and if the U.S.-China trade war actually starts, you know, uh, tamping down GDP growth um, even more. What, what does that do for the 2020 election? So this is this is the question, right? So, I, and I, I could. Like I think we all would instinctively feel it, but but I can give you an answer that's even more precise than that. And by that I mean, no matter what happens to GDP or housing starts or auto sales, over the last hundred years, there's only one economic indicator that matters for the outcome of the presidential election, and that's the unemployment rate. And right now, the unemployment rate is at the lowest level since December of 1969. If it, it you know, and, and now that's the September unemployment rate. We won't know the November rate until the beginning of December. But whatever the unemployment rate for November 2018 is, if the unemployment rate is higher than that in uh, 2020, in October of 2020, right? then the president would be unlikely to be reelected. And the reason that that's mattered over the last 100 years, we looked at GDP, didn't matter. You could be in a recession, you could be out of a recession, you could have strong growth, it it didn't really matter at all. The only thing that mattered is, was there a change in the unemployment rate? And uh, so four four times this has happened in the last 100 years. Uh, Herbert Hoover saw an increase in the unemployment rate during that 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 24 month window between the November of the, the midterms to the, uh, the October of uh, the, the general election during that time window, Hoover saw an increase, Ford, Carter, and George H.W. Bush. The only four people to not be reelected in the last hundred years. So it's not a coincidence. GDP changed. Sometimes you could have people negative GDP, they get reelected. You could have a negative change. You could have a positive change. Didn't matter. Housing starts, auto sales, industrial production, didn't matter. The only thing that mattered was the unemployment rate. Now, uh, and and by the way, the unemployment rate could still be low or the change could be small, but any change at all means that there's more people that are worse off when that general election happens. And by the way, unemployed people vote and they have the time to vote and they will vote. And so, you know, that's really the, the number you have to watch. It's not so much, well, what if the trade bubble and what if, no, 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 If the unemployment rate goes up from 3.7 or from whatever number we find out November is, which will, you know, probably be somewhere between 3.5 and 4%, if the unemployment rate goes up from that, that's where we begin to have a bit more of a concern um, and, and think, uh, of, of, and- of an implication. Just to um, sort of round out our discussion, um, can we talk a little bit about, you know, the risk fact, you know, the per- sort of permanent large risk factors that you identified and the implications for the freight economy in the United States and the movement of goods and specifically uh, transportation companies' exposure to those sorts of risks? Yeah, so, I mean, I think as we think about the implications for freight and freight economy and, and what we, you know, might expect from the election, I think the USMCA moving forward is very important and positive for freight across North America. Otherwise, I think it uh, could have added uh, ripples of what economists call transactional friction. Uh, in terms of the risk factors in general, 
you know, if we look at higher interest rates, right, that's, that's negative for capital equipment purchases. That's going to have a slowing impact on business investment, on equipment purchases. So there are some risks to freight no matter who wins the election because the biggest risk factors are the trade policy with China. And so what you can see is more, again, and we've already seen this in some of the inventory numbers, but a big bump in inventory uh, ahead of the new year as, as importers try to get ahead of more tariffs on Chinese goods. So you could see a lot of hot freight activity going into the end of the year, very frenzied kind of under the wire sort of stuff. Uh, and then once we hit next year, you know, the, 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 the higher interest rates, slowing housing, slowing auto sales, slowing equipment sales, uh, those could have a dampening effect on freight a little bit next year. And by the end of next year, end of 2019 and into 2020, there are downsides there as well. And, and those risks exist outside the realm of the election, no matter the outcome. Right. So those are sort of baked into the U.S.'s political culture in, this, in, in terms of the debt and are sort of baked into the economic cycle uh, in terms of, you know, monetary policy. And then again, you know, also seemingly set in stone um, the, the trade policy is with um, Trump and Navarro's sort of approach to the China relationship. So, I mean, bottom line, what you're saying is that the things that are going to uh, turn the cycle for trucking and for freight are, are sort of long developing, slow moving, and kind of um, unstoppable at this point. Well, I, I, would, I would add a caveat to that. So I feel that there is, so I agree that these things are already kind of brewing. So I, let me say that first. But, so things are already brewing. Whether they're slow moving or not uh, is a different factor. And so things like housing, we saw a number take a hit for September. You know, things like housing and business investment, they can turn quite quickly. And as a matter of fact, there was a contraction uh, in the most recent, in the third quarter in uh, business investment. Inventories went up uh, and that drove up investment, but outside of inventories, business investment actually went down. And so that can turn quite quickly. But the, the big takeaway is, you know, I think aside from the fact that those things can turn fast, is that even if everyone came back as a Republican or if everyone came back as a Democrat, it doesn't matter uh, for these bigger risk factors uh, that are likely to affect trucking in the U.S. economy. Uh, for now, they, uh, the, the, the water's been boiling kind of slowly but I would caution that when things begin to slow, they can sometimes move a little bit quicker than we expect. Thank you so much, Jason. Um, this has been a really enlightening discussion. I think you, your project on politics and economics is you know, fascinating, and I can't wait to uh, hear more from you at Market Waves. Yes, and just to reiterate, thank you again to JP and Jason for being here with us today, as well as to everyone here on the line. Um, as we mentioned, Jason will be joining us at Market Waves here in the next couple of weeks. So if you haven't gotten your tickets to that yet, visit marketwaves18.com and you can get registered and view the agenda, speaker lineup, the demo lineup. It's going to be a really, really exciting couple of days. So thank you both for being here. Thank you all for listening in, and we hope you'll join us again next time.